I tell you what, before we get going with any of this, and I'm really not in the Raw zone, but we got to talk about it. I'm, I'm just a little chapped over Raw, but go ahead. Can we start with a little classic <laughs> audio? Well, we, we can start with anything. This is your program, as you mention every time it comes off well. Well, you mention it every time there's a problem. Well, that's because I want to put the blame in the proper position there, pal. All right, I have two bits of audio here. I'm going to let you choose what we hear. One of them is very short, and I actually don't remember this one. Funny. The, na the name of the video is Funny. Jimmy Hart shoots straight with Jimmy Kent. Gets nailed. 1981 oh. Memphis. Oh, I think I remember, but go ahead. That one, and then we also have it's a little bit longer. And again, pre-fabulous ones. This is a, wow, Garen Shea uploaded this. There's a name we haven't heard in a very long time. This is an old upload, but uh, I don't know whatever happened to Garen after he got sick. Well, don't, gee, now. What is it down or now? I know, see. It. I was about, we owe it to people also to resolve that fucking cliffhanger at some point, don't we? Did I hear? I, I don't, I don't want to say that I may have heard bad th things about Garen's illness, but we don't know for sure, so. I don't know, but the name of the video is Memphis Wrestling Stan Lane Quits the First Family. Well, I tell you, I, I love Stanfield. But also, besides the fact that I think I want to hear Jimmy Hart and Jimmy Kent, because I believe I remember that deal. Also, if nobody has heard Jimmy Kent, and there's a name that doesn't get a lot of publicity these days in the modern world, but Jimmy Kent in the 70s was one of the weaseliest, heat gettingest connivingest heel managers in the wrestling business. And to be honest, he took it to a ridiculous level, the amount that he would interfere in the, in the matches and try to get heat, and it didn't get the wrong kind of heat with those people because the, the heels were over, the baby face were over, and they just got mad. But if you go back and look at it now, it's like, oh, Jesus Christ, fucking you're taking away from everything. But he could also take the goddamnedest bumps and he would run from the baby faces and dive away from them through and over the ropes in insane fashion and come off the top and do all this other shit. But he was just, he was active as fuck. And he was also country as a mud fence. And so if this is the interview I'm thinking about, it might be funny just to hear a little Jimmy Kent from 1981 and 2024. Let's go to this. And again, 1981, Jimmy Hart and the First Family is amazing stuff. Everything in his run until like the very end of Memphis is amazing. But 81 is really the year yeah. that stands out. Anytime you put him with Chick Donovan, it really stands out. But well, the, 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 the talent in the First Family was the best at that point. And also that was the first year of Jimmy Hart's angle with, and, and program with Lawler. And he had so many stars that they brought in that he could wear Austin Idol and Joe LaDuke and Hulk Hogan and the Funk Brothers and blah, blah, blah. 81 was just amazing. But go ahead. Let's go to this video right now. Jimmy Hart shoots straight with Jimmy Kent and gets nailed. Sullivan as, uh, as they were. Hold on. It started right in the middle of it. Hold on, Jace. Sorry. Here we go. Hey, this, uh, of course, is another continuing story that Jimmy Hart is now the manager look at this, baby. yeah well look at this right yeah i see brother. where it belongs i understand oh, right. that look at this Memphis, look at this. yeah hey, you know and i think it's all all fitting that you should have it uh, around your waist too because uh, you were as much responsible for the upset win of uh ferris and sullivan as uh, as they were in there and i know you got shut to... up porky tell that big fat slob to shut up hey, over there i'm so sick of these people down here Just... i'm paying let me tell you something i am on top of the world right now baby oh. because did i not tell you did i not tell you i said one of these days i'm gonna be right back with a southern heavyweight champion and it couldn't please me more better because that big fat dream machine you know what sure i hurt me a little bit when the dream left me you know why because i had so much advertising space sold on that big fat stomach oh. of his man he <laughs> cost me a lot of money. that's the only way he cost me any money i'm the one that put the woo in the dream baby I let me stop this for a second Jimmy Hart comes in as Jerry Lawler's manager when he didn't really have to say anything. He just stood there with a mustache. Yes. Then he becomes the manager. This is a very short period of time before you end up becoming a manager. 
you've always talked about Bobby Heenan and how he was the greatest in your eyes and you got to see him and what an influence he was. Seeing Jimmy Hart just in a couple of years burst into this, I mean, this is amazing. Did it change the way you saw managers? I mean, what did you think of this as it was happening? You're, again, you're just a couple of years from getting into the business when it really starts. Jimmy was a big influence on me. More, how can I phrase this where people understand it? More in the matches and in the the active part of managing than promos necessarily. And I'm not saying that there he wasn't some of that as well, but we both got influenced by Memphis wrestling because Jimmy was a fan. He was at the goddamn uh, uh, Sputnik Monroe and Billy Wicks match. In 59. He, yes, he was, you know, when he was a kid, he was getting in free at the Ellis Auditorium for selling programs and, you know, whatever the case. And, you know, he took the sojourn into music, but he still always lived in Memphis. When he, if, and when he, you know, was still touring, he was always back there. Point is, and Lawler influenced both of us, but Jimmy did it like, Jimmy did it, and I did it like I did it. As far as the and Jimmy had that personality. Oh, baby, baby, but that was the rock and roll part, right? That was him being the, you know. Do people know that he did have a legitimate gold record with "Keep On Dancing"? And Jimmy Hart and the Gentries were, you know, a group that was on Dick Clark's American Bandstand and blah 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 in the sixties. So he he had the show business outfits and the monogram music notes on his jackets and that was him because that was him and so i couldn't come out oh yeah baby i'll let your baby this because he was showbiz i wasn't i was the the rich kid so i had to kind of be that way but the the influence that he had on me was seeing how they booked him and what he did at ringside and what he did to keep heat and you know, how not to get in the way and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, he did have an influence on me. But remember, he he started in, well, let's say, September, October of 79. And really didn't do anything until February of the next year when Lawler broke his leg. And that's when they started putting the emphasis on him. So he had to suddenly become the motor mouth, the, the heel that was carrying the whole territory when he'd been in the business doing none of that, just being Lawler's sidekick for, what, six months. So he just turned it on instantly because he had to. At least when I started, there wasn't that much pressure on me. I could actually start talking from the beginning, but the whole territory wasn't fucking counting on me, thank God. You know, and I, I got some experience, as we've noted, and, you know, got some practice and then got out of there and, and did something else. But anyway, but let's go back to the audio, though. I didn't mean to continue droning on. Now, real quick, one question about that. Was that one of the things that made Lawler so different and really so effective was that he was almost like a heel manager, but he was a wrestler? Because there weren't yes. a lot of heels who talked like that or behaved like that. Yes, that's why, you know, I, he was gangly and awkward in the the pictures that you see from his rookie year and no video exists, but, uh, you know, he, the, what the, that uh, Knoxville TV is from 72? December of 72. Yeah. So that's two years after his first match and you could tell that he was carrying it in the ring. He was carrying his end, I should say, but already... He was a fucking promo, a genius. That's what. That's why they put him together with Jim White, so that because Jim White was the veteran and he could kind of lead the match, and Sam Bass was the stooge manager that Lawler would keep as a heel through most of his life. But Lawler became the star within the first couple, you know, weeks that they saw the team on television because nobody talked like that then. Nobody talked like that. Anyway. Let's go back to this audio. Jimmy Hart uh, talking to Lance Russell. We're waiting on Jimmy Kent. 
You feel fantastic, Russell. What do you want to say to me? Anything you want to say? Oh, I just uh, want to find out <laughs> if you, in fact, are going to be able to uh, sustain. You've had a little trouble keeping some of your high-priced talent in line in here in Dutch Mantel well, I don't care. Just a minute. Excuse me just a minute. Come on, Jim. Vance Russell, I want to talk to you. No, listen, Jimmy, I, I told you not today. You're not scheduled for an interview. Look, I've been trying to run you down. I've been trying to get an opportunity yeah, I, to talk to you. Yeah, I know you've you been trying hard, to run everybody you, down. You give hard all the chance to talk. Just, you give the Zoom, the Zombie. Jimmy. All them. I don't have another here. chance. You don't, we don't need to end here. I have an interview what, with Jimmy Hart. Why come I can't make an interview? I'm tired of being on the bottom. I'll tell you. I can't never get a chance to make an interview. I can handle it where you don't have to let me stop it before jimmy hart jumps in because you're losing it over there I just, just again jimmy kent he he they used him he was the first manager of jerry lawler and jim white for about six weeks and then they switched and got sam bass because they had worked with sam bass in alabama and they knew each other but also jimmy took all the fucking attention the motor mouth right that Southern accent. He's like I said, he's so fucking country. And it, it, that he looks like one of the little rascals facially, also the space between his teeth in the front and that moon face shaped face. But he would just with the bounty hunters, Jerry and David Novak, they used him on top, and he was with them for a couple of years in the early 70s. And as I said, what a fucking bumping machine and just a little squirt right like he may be 195 pounds and he's not five foot ten but he could work in his own way and i you know he just always tickled me to watch him but he's the guy that one time when he left the tennessee territory he was in a loser leave town match in tupelo mississippi and he showed up to the arena in front of the fans with his car pulling a u-haul with his family in the back seat and you know what the fuck? And I see, he was managing the bounty hunters in 1975 in the Louisville Gardens, and got the people so riled up they started hitting the fucking ring. And there was this guy with what was it? Oh God damn it! Room 222 was that the there was there a kid in the 70s, a white guy, but he had like a big afro. I'm trying to remember what show it was on. But this guy, white guy with a giant afro for some reason, it fucking came into the goddamn ring and Jerry Novak grabbed a hold of him and with one hand in his hair and started punching him in the face with the other. And by the time the guy dropped off the edge of the apron, he had all, it looked like he'd pulled his wig off. He had almost all the guy's hair still in his hand. Oh my God. Anyway, Jimmy Kent, and he's he's out there going crazy. Anyway, go ahead. Continue on with this dissertation. Yeah, one more thing. What do you think of Lance Russell's role here? It's not just I'm the commentator, I'm the host, I'm the announcer. You can't mess with me. He has authority. I'll make sure you can never do come out here again and do an interview. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and see, that's the thing. Also, what they were doing with Jimmy, I'm glad you mentioned it, at this time was, obviously, you can tell he's pissed off for lack of respect. But he had come in, I think he had had a run with the bounty hunters at this point, and then he was on the way out, and they were going to do something with him and Jimmy, some special fucking gimmick manager match or whatever. But since the people kind of saw Jimmy Kent at that point as an underneath manager, they decided to go, all right, let's go with it. He's been here in the past, he's done well, but now everybody sees he's jerking the curtain or is, it ain't happening. So he's mad at Jimmy Hart. Let's see these two weasels get in a fucking cat fight. Well, let's go back to this now. Jimmy, I, I might be able to help you out, man, if, I, if you listen to me. I want to tell you something. If you don't mind me saying this, I'm going to shoot straight with you, and I'll tell you exactly why you're on the bottom and I'm on top. First of all, turn right around here to this camera. Get a close shot of this. Look at this red on this man's oh, neck God. right here. Jimmy, not <laughs> Look at this. You no, guys come on. I'm shoot, wait a minute. I'm shooting straight with you. You want to know the truth? And I'll tell you the truth. When I was in the seventh grade of high school, man, I used to come out and see you at ringside, and I thought, boy, Jimmy Kent, he's quick, he's fast, he's sharp. Until I got to know you, man, you're slowly. You're completely. Okay. So look, no, wait a 
a minute. I'm talking you, now. Well, you I'm helping the man outside. out here. Listen to me. Look at this. Look at this big fat. Look at this big fat right, belly. Look yeah, at this big on, fat belly, on. man. Let's... You are ignorant <laughs> like the people out here are ignorant. From now on, I'm going to be from Boston, Massachusetts, baby. That's where you ought to be from, maybe. Well, but see, you, you fit in with all these people. He fits in with these people out here. Now, did I not shoot straight with him? Or did I not shoot straight? You're ignorant. That's just the whole thing. Okay, You're stupid, Jimmy. man. Okay. I'm through with You know what? I'm trying to help the man out. I'm trying to help the man out. I'm trying to help you out, man. Both of you. Interviews so terminated. Look at, look at yourself. Here. Look at your boots, your pants. Look at, look at your shirt. Tail okay, right we've got uh, oh, plenty of action. Come hey, on, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Let me treat you one thing. I tell you what, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. Now, you Connie. understand me? Hey, listen. Yeah, I ain't big enough for the I'm both of us. I'm telling you. And I'm going to stop your head in. I'm going gonna... to challenge you to a match, right? If you don't get out of here, get your men, you and, and your men you never will appear on this television. Now, get out of here. Don't hit him. Don't hit him, Jimmy. Don't hit him. Now, get out of here. I don't want to have any more of this stuff. We're going to take time out and uh, we're going gonna... to. Oh, I'll kill you, you know. Take time out and we'll be back. <laughs> Well, stop it there. How could anyone watch that and not have to stay to see how this is going to end? Yes, and the people wouldn't, when Jimmy had too many Jimmys there, but when Jimmy can't pop Jimmy Hart, the people scream, and he said, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. And and Jimmy Kent would be leaving because it wasn't, but Jimmy Hart was on top. By the way, was Jimmy Hart lying about his age back then? I used yes. to see it ringside yes. when I was in seventh grade. No, well, no see, that, way. <laughs> no, but that's his way of, of basically making people think of Jimmy Kent's, you know, insulting his age, right? Yeah, you were a big deal before electricity. I used to carry your bags in. Uh, Jimmy, let's, how old? Hold on. Let me do some math here. Let me think about this. 1980, yeah, 40. Jimmy was Jimmy Hart was 37 there. Jimmy Kent had been in the business since night. Let's say he was born in I think Jimmy Kent may have been about three or four years younger than Jimmy Hart. <laughs> According to something I see here, he was born December 1946. Well, then, then I think he's three years younger than Jimmy Hart. But see, he had started young, whereas Jimmy, with the music, didn't. Uh, Jimmy didn't get in the wrestling business till he was what, thirty five, thirty six. So you know, but it's all relative because Jimmy Hart was new to the fans there, but they'd seen Jimmy Kent from ten years before. Well, there it is, some classic audio from Memphis, nineteen eighty one. We'll keep this trend going next time. But you know, the other thing that stands out, I always say it, I critique. I criticize, I put down the commentators on a lot of these shows. When you hear someone like Lance Russell, who's a master at it, just hosting the show, making things move along. Yes. How, how could you take anyone else seriously? And that's the thing, because he took the things that were happening seriously, and he reacted like Lance Russell would react. And he had magnetism and charisma also. And people trusted him, and they liked him. He was the most popular person on the program and so it it can even though all this chaos was going on with these weird wild wacky wonderful people that were on this wrestling program lance looked like the guy that you know lived next door your uncle somebody in a suit that you would invite over for sunday dinner he, he wasn't wearing a mask claiming to have wrestled at one point professionally in front of 14 people in a fucking sardine can. Or he wasn't putting on airs and putting on the announcer voice as he talks about the next paper. He was, he was calling it. And remember when we listen to the audio, and especially you go back to those films in the 70s of the main events in the Mid-South Coliseum, they look and sound like old 50s fight films. The people are going out of their fucking mind. They're, ooh, every time a guy lands a punch. Oh! And that voice pierces through all that stuff. And it, it's because it, it, he started in radio. So you can tell what's going on without him resorting to calling every move by name. You can tell who has the advantage and who's at the disadvantage and how much trouble the guy's in by just listening to him. 